Thank you for inviting me, nevertheless, <laughs> uh, and for inviting Gavi uh, to this conference. Um, I do feel a little bit different. I'm not a scientist. Uh, Gavi focuses more on the implementation and funding side. Um, but I have been hearing a lot of references to market failure, um, partnerships, and a lot of other things that, that we think about a lot as well. So I think there will be some interesting, uh, interesting touch points. Uh, I think this is also the time that I was supposed to end my presentation, so I'll, I'll, try, to be, I'll try to be quick. Um, I'll start with a little bit of a, an, a background on, on, on what Gavi is, um, since I think there's a few people in the room who, who, aren't, um, who aren't very familiar. Um, so Gavi is a, is a public-private partnership um, based in uh, Geneva. Uh, our mission is to save children's lives and protect people's health by increasing equitable use of vaccines in lower income countries. Um, it was founded in, uh, in the year 2000 um, at a time when it was clear that immunization rates in developing countries were stagnating um, after the great advances that had been made uh, by WHO and UNICEF primarily. Uh, 20, 30 years earlier, and also that there was a long time lag between the introduction of new vaccines into high-income countries and then into low-income countries, um, with a lot of new vaccines that had actually, you know, never made it into most of the poorest countries yet at that time. So Gavi was really created to address that gap. Um, with um, uh, a big grant from, from, from the Gates Foundation, from Bill Gates, uh, and several other donors um, joining in. And uh, yeah, that was 17 years ago. We're still going, we've grown, we've spent about um, one and a half to two billion dollars a year on vaccine procurement. Um, so in a nutshell, this is the, um, this is the Gavi model. Um, we support the world's poorest countries as defined by gross national income per capita. Uh, we have a, a threshold level under which countries are eligible and can apply for, uh, for support. It's demand driven, so we, we invite governments to apply for support um, if they want to introduce a new vaccine. We don't, we don't sort of initiate projects ourselves. Um, in terms of the funding, uh, the, the model is such that um, uh, we require all governments to contribute to the cost of the vaccine. So for every dose we, we procure and, and provide, uh, we expect a co-payment from the government. And that co-payment co is smaller or larger depending on the, um, on the economic development level of the country. Um, so that's what we call co-financing. Um, of course, we have a donor base uh, with, um, I've lost track, but 20 or 25 or so uh, donors, mostly sovereign donors and, and, and the Gates Foundation still. Um, and we do something that we call market shaping, um, which means that we don't just raise the money and buy the vaccines and ship them to, to, to developing countries, but we actually try to actively engage with the vaccine markets, with, with manufacturers um, to, you know, not just in a transactional arrangement, but really in a partnership and to ultimately try and influence and shape and change those markets to the benefit of, um, of, of lower income countries to create, um, uh, you know, a, a larger variety of, 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 of products, uh, more supply security, obviously lower prices, but that's not that's not the only goal. It's really also about a longer term view of um, the the health of that market. Um, we support 12 vaccines. More on that uh, in a minute. Um, obviously, vaccines that are in the market that are licensed. Um, uh, so that's that's where we have a, a different focus from from most of your work. Um, vaccines don't deliver themselves, um, and uh, in many of the countries that we support, the uh, health systems and supply chains um, are uh, not as robust as they should be. Uh, so we also uh, provide grants to countries to help strengthen those delivery systems, um, whether it's supply chain investments, cold chain, um, uh, human resources, um, uh, management. Um, and finally, uh, Gavi is, is not a charity, as we'd like to say. It's a development model. It's a development organization. Uh, as I mentioned before, we expect governments to, to co-finance every vaccine we provide. Uh, and that co-financing share goes up over time 
as economies grow, which means that ultimately when, when countries pass that threshold that we have, that, that income threshold, um, they will have to, we, we will phase out our support and they will have to pick up the full cost of those vaccines, at which point they transition out of Gavi, hopefully with a lot of new vaccines introduced that otherwise would have been unaffordable. And hopefully, of course, they sustain those vaccines. But that that is a, that is going to be a big, big question uh, for the coming years when, when a number of large countries are, are about to transition out of Gavi, actually. Um, these are the countries that we support, uh, 73 several of which have actually reached that threshold, so are in the, in the last final years of, of transitioning out of Gavi. Um, this uh, equates to a birth cohort of about 80 million children per year, so it's, uh, um, it's, it, it, the reach is large, and it also means that we, we can have a strong negotiating position uh, with, with industry, um, uh, for whom this market obviously is, uh, uh, is, is substantial. So since the beginning, uh, with Gavi support, 600 million children have been, additional children have been immunized, and uh, the WHO estimates that as a, as a result, 8 million deaths uh, have been averted. Um, these are the vaccines that we support, um, listed here on a timeline based on when they were added to the, to the Gavi portfolio. Um, and in the beginning, we, we, we often talk about the, the, you know, the low-hanging fruit vaccines. When Gavi started, um, the most obvious gaps were for hepatitis B and, and Haemophilus influenza type B vaccine, Hib vaccine. Um, and so uh, those vaccines were very, very quickly included in the portfolio, later brought together in the combination pentavalent vaccine. Um, yellow fever was not really a new vaccine, but certainly an underused vaccine. Uh, and then a few years down the line, pneumococcal and rotavirus came along, and, and now we really started to see um, an acceleration in terms of access to vaccines, because these vaccines were really qu quite new, even in, in the high-income world. And with the support that Gavi was able to, to, to provide, these vaccines could now be introduced in developing countries just one or just a few years after um, these vaccines were, were rolled out in, in high-income countries, and, and that's what, what the Gavi model is, is really all about. Um, the meningitis A vaccine in the meningitis belt um, uh, had an enormous impact on the, uh, on the incidence of that disease, although we're not seeing other serotypes uh, come up, but meningitis A um, has largely been suppressed. Um, and more recently, uh, HPV, um, measles and rubella, uh, Japanese encephalitis have been added to the portfolio. We also support a global uh, stockpile of oral cholera vaccine and most recently have um, made commitments to support a future Ebola vaccine uh, stockpile through an advanced purchase commitment. Um, so how, how, do we, uh, how does Gavi decide what vaccines to support. There's obviously more vaccines out there than, um, than, than we have resources to spend. Um, so we need to prioritize. And as you can see from this timeline, in the beginning, um, there weren't as many choices. Um, but then, you know, as Gavi gained momentum, as more money started flowing in, as the model got proof of concept, um, the different vaccine research and groups and, and manufacturers started coming to us more and more saying, oh, what about this vaccine? What about this vaccine? You should invest in this and that. And, and our board was starting to get a bit overwhelmed and, and said, well, you know, these all sound like very compelling cases, but, um, but how do we know if we say yes to something today that there isn't going to be another vaccine that comes along tomorrow and we will have depleted our resources? And because Gavi isn't about one-off um, projects to launch a vaccine or doing doing short campaigns, it's really, we're in it for the long term, because many of these countries, um, uh, poorest countries, you know, based on the economic projections, will be sort of uh, within Gavi eligibility for a long time. And the support we provide is to help launch the vaccine, but then also continued support for the, for the use of that vaccine in root, national routine immunization programs. So that every year um, we provide the doses for for all newborn babies to be vaccinated. So once we say yes to a vaccine, it, it comes with an enormous legacy um, and an agenda that will take many years, if not decades, to complete. So 
So you've got to be strategic about about how you uh, how you set the priorities, and of course, in a way, this is also um, the 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 the, joy, the choice and the dilemmas that that countries themselves face uh, when thinking about making these investments. Um, so our board, uh, about ten years ago, said, "Look, we need a more strategic approach rather than having these investment cases come to us one by one piecemeal." Um, we need to take a broader look at all the various vaccines that are out there, but also have a look into the future. What's in the pipeline? What's coming? Because we need to be prepared. And that's, um, that triggered the, the development of, of the vaccine investment strategy, which is really a process that we undertake um, once every five years. Um, uh, and it's, it's an evidence-driven approach to identify new priorities. So, um, it's got a transparent methodology where we come up with a list of criteria to evaluate all the possible candidates um, and be able to compare them to each other. Um, it involves lots of consultations with many people like yourselves and, and, uh, and WHO and, and, and other experts uh, and lots of analysis and modeling of the potential impact, cost, etc., trying to forecast into the future if Gavi were to, to, to support these vaccines. So what that allows us to do is a strategic investment decision making uh, rather than a first come first serve approach, which was a little bit the, the, the model in the early years. Uh, and importantly, it creates predictability um, for, for three very important groups for, for, for our donors because by um, uh, deciding on what vaccines we are going to support in the years to come, we can come up with estimates of what that will cost and you know, we can give a quite precise um, funding requests to our donors as opposed to having to come back every time for more funding. Um, it creates predictability for industry um, knowing where knowing, knowing where there will be a market uh, for, for the products they develop and of course for the countries themselves um, it, uh, it, it can really be a make or break um, uh, criteria whether or not Gavi funds a vaccine um, because uh, if there's no Gavi funding, some of these vaccines are, are, are simply unaffordable uh, to developing countries. <coughs> um, we've done it twice, and we're about to start the third uh, VIS, as we call it. Um, and this is just to, to show how it relates to our strategic periods. We, Gavi works with a replenishment model, just like the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria where we um, have these five-year strategic periods, we try and calculate the resources that we will need in that period, then we go organize this big replenishment conference, um, and a lot of work uh, goes into preparing for that and, and get, garnering the resources. Um, and we ask to be funded for that period. So we did that in Berlin two years ago um, when we needed uh, $9 billion uh, for this current period, which was successfully raised, so we are fully funded for this period, which is a nice place to, to be in. Um, and uh, But for the next period, which may seem far off, 21 to 25, but we're already starting to prepare for that. Uh, and the VIS it, it plays a really important role in this, because the VIS will tell us what our new priorities will be, and therefore what our spending will be. Um, uh, and therefore what, our, what, what money we need to ask for. So that's why these, these decisions need to be taken by Gavi next year uh, so that we can feed that into the development of the, of the, of the ask, so to say, for, for our donors for the next strategic period. Um, this is an example from the last uh, round in 2013 of the, the criteria that we developed to look at uh, some 12 different vaccines Health impact criteria, obviously, um, impact on mortality, morbidity, child mortality. Then we had some additional, more qualitative impact criteria, looking at epidemic potential, um, whether or not there were alternative interventions available, any special benefits for, um, for, for marginalized groups, those kinds of things. Um, then implementation feasibility, a very important one, um, uh, because like I said before, the, the context can be quite limiting. Um, in terms of health system supply chain. So, so that's an important one to look at. And cost and value for money, uh, which is, of course, important for our donors. Um, so in order to be able to compare all the vaccines against all those criteria, um, we need to do um, uh, 
lots of analysis, uh, and we have to make lots of assumptions because we also do look at vaccines that aren't yet licensed, but close to licensure, uh, for which you sometimes don't know yet what the what the schedule will be, what the target age group will be. We don't. There's there's no WHO recommendation yet, so there's a lot of a lot of guessing that goes into that informed guessing. Uh, in terms of what the vaccination scenarios will be, therefore what the demand forecast will be, therefore what the total impact would be and the cost, um, and then all of those other criteria. Um, this is an example of uh, from dengue. Uh, so of the neglected tro tropical diseases, there were there were two in the last round: dengue and rabies. Um, and they, um, well, I, I won't. I won't. Uh, you probably know that these are not Gavi vaccines. So. Uh, <laughs> Won't keep you in suspense. They didn't. They didn't make it through the prioritization for various reasons. But they will be re-entering this next uh, next round that we're starting now for decisions next year. So as you can see here, uh, the sort of scorecard for for dengue um, that was evaluated against all those criteria and then compared with the other vaccines in the mix, resulting in these this this color coding. Um, you can imagine we had 12 of these, and it wasn't necessarily straightforward to then rank them um, uh, because it's really apples and oranges for many of these these different vaccines. Um, uh, dengue, uh, at the time the vaccine, the Sanofi vaccine was still in clinical trials. Um, when we did the analyses, um, the burden in Gavi eligible countries, in particular in Africa, was very unclear. Um, also, the mortality impact was l estimated to be limited. Um, and the, the, combined with the estimated cost of the, the projected cost of the vaccine, it didn't, it couldn't compete with some of the other uh, options in the mix. Um, on rabies, uh, we do this in, diff in several steps. Uh, we first have a long list of vaccines, and then we go to a short list. Um, uh, rabies did make it onto the short list, um, but ultimately not for for uh, for an investment. Um, well, for research investment, but I'll get to that. So this is just <laughs> a snapshot of, of some of the things we looked at. Um, uh, some very compelling uh, arguments for um, putting funding behind the scale-up of rabies vaccines. Um, one of the oldest vaccines around highly effective post-exposure in preventing um, a fatal outcome of a, of a horrible disease. Um, however, uh, lots of questions around the how. Uh, and, and not just the how in countries, but also the how for Gavi, a global funding agency, and what Gavi could do to sort of um, to, to to increase access to to this important vaccine. Um, so in this case, it was there wasn't enough evidence to um, to compel our board to say yes, we'll we'll go into this because again, Gavi is a is a sort of large scale global mechanism. Um, it's not about small projects, you know, we, we sort of open a window, as we say, where, where then 73 countries can potentially apply for support. <coughs> so you need to have a little bit of certainty around um, what the need is, what the cost will be. And, and it, was, it was very difficult to understand that because of, because of a lot of gaps in, in evidence. And in this case, this was the second time already that we had looked at rabies. We looked at it back in 2008 as well. And the sad thing about it was that very little had changed in the in the evidence base. And and so this compelled our board to say, well, we, we can't really, this, this isn't enough for Gavi to say, yes, we'll fund the vaccine, but let's at least try and invest in some implementation research because clearly that's where, that's somehow where we get stuck because we don't understand what the implementation, the operational challenges are. And so since then, we have um, invested in a, in, a, in a learning agenda in a number of studies to try and better understand um, what the challenges are at the country level, which hopefully will put us in a better position come next year when we will look at rabies for a third time. Um, this is just a quick snapshot of uh, all the, the vaccines that we looked at and how they ranked. Um, and this is a preliminary look at um, the uh, candidate vaccines <coughs> that will be up for consideration in this next round, um, starting, uh, well, we, we're, we've already started um, in Geneva. Decisions will be taken next year, but uh, quite a number of exciting candidates there. Um, a number of returning candidates like dengue and rabies, 
um, and a number of what we call incremental investments, so investments in whether it's an additional vaccination strategy or additional serotypes uh, of a vaccine that we already support in some way, but where we don't have the mandate to, for example, fund uh, PCV catch-up campaigns. Um, and then uh, vaccines under development. Uh, RSV, I think, um, looks to be the most promising candidate here. Um, and there's a number of vaccines on here that I have to admit we were a bit surprised. We got this list from WHO just um, just last week, actually. <clears throat> so today, the, the initial assessment of, of uh, what vaccines of public health importance should we be considering. Um, and uh, I think there's probably a, a few borderliners here uh, that may, may fall off uh, quite quickly <clears throat> just because their development timelines are too uncertain. Um, so <clears throat> the last slide, uh, I tried to think uh, about um, what role Gavi can play in accelerating neglected tropical disease vaccine development and access, recognizing that, that Gavi is not a research organization and, and we, don't, we don't principally fund research. It's really about implementation. Um, but I think there are important touch points um, that we'll talk about more in the panel as well. So for <clears throat> licensed vaccines like rabies and dengue, um, pilots implementation research, I think other people have mentioned it already, is, <clears throat> is, is very important and I think um, we're, we're seeing a shift where in the, <clears throat> in the past efficacy and safety data from phase three trials were often enough to then move into large-scale implementation, in part because high-income countries had already had the vaccine in use, and, and so it was easy to make that step in developing countries. Um, but increasingly, with more complex vaccines like RTSS, like dengue, we're seeing that coming out of the trials, <clears throat> it isn't so clear uh, how you would actually now scale up the vaccine, in particular for vaccines that are targeted towards developing countries, where you don't have that cross-check with, um, with the experience that's already been gained in, 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 the, in the richer countries. Um, and there isn't, uh, there isn't an obvious funding mechanism for this, for this step of the, of the process from R&D to, to implementation. And we really found that with RTSS, and there's not enough time now, but um, <clears throat> perhaps in the panel this is something we can spend a little bit of time on, the RTSS pilots that Gavi did decide to fund, but um, wasn't, wasn't an easy decision. So just to put that out there, uh, large-scale implementation, of course, is that is really our, our, our core business. Um, as part of that, uh, we are in an ongoing dialogue with, with all of those countries and with the EPI programs, and, and we do, there is a feedback loop around product preferences, for example, which we convey back to, to industry as well. Um, so that's, that's one area of, 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 of market shaping, if you will. Um, uh, and then um, other, other market shaping tools include advanced market commitments, advanced purchase commitments, where you, you create a pool mechanism essentially for, for industry to be incentivized to invest in a product, whether it's to develop the product or to scale up production. We've tried that with pneumococcal vaccine and, <clears throat> and the latest APC is for Ebola vaccine. For vaccines in development, um, so here, uh, Gavi doesn't have direct funding to offer. Um, however, through this VIS process, what we can offer is a view of what are the prioritization criteria, what are some of the things that we look at or that, that Gavi as a global funding organization would, would prioritize, and also what data do we need to make those decisions? Because sometimes the case may be compelling enough, but if there isn't enough data, we can't justify it towards our donors to make a multi-billion dollar investment based on one randomized controlled trial, for example. This was one of the issues we had with maternal flu. Um, and that decision also couldn't, couldn't be taken. There just wasn't, wasn't enough evidence. And the flu community was very surprised because they thought it was so compelling. But um, it's, it's also about the quality of the evidence. Um, so I think that's one contribution that we can, we can make to perhaps some of the thinking and the work that, that, that research groups do. Um, signaling non-binding interest this is something we're exploring for this next VIS, um, and a disease like chikungunya, um, which may just fall off the, the typical horizon we look at, because we look at vaccines that are maximum five years out, 
Um, but could we perhaps signal lo longer term interest in, in such vaccines and, and how it's non-binding because we can't make a financial commitment, but, but what, how would that signal need to be to be a true of true interest to industry. And finally, um, uh, as I mentioned before, vaccines don't live, deliver themselves. Um, uh, Gavi also invests in, <coughs> in immunization systems, um, uh, including um, some very innovative things. There is a, there is a pilot ongoing with drones uh, delivering uh, different health products through drones. It sounds wacky, but, uh, and rabies vaccines is one of the potential candidates for that because you know it's particularly interesting for things that you need to deliver very very quickly um, that's that's not at skill I just wanted to mention it because it's such a cool project but uh, um, but health system strengthening um, you know we also have to be aware that immunization programs have expanded massively and and in some ways are overloaded with vaccines and we can't just keep piling vaccines on top. Um, so it's it's also about increasing the capacity of those systems to absorb additional interventions, including through new platforms like maternal immunization, second year of life, um, uh, et cetera. So that's another contribution I think um, we can potentially make to preparing the world uh, for for increased, um, increased use of vaccines against uh, neglected tropical diseases. Thank you.